Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. And in this context, in the current module, we are discussing about the different ways in which you can be able to measure the enzyme activity. So if you recall, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the uh, different uh, uh, aspects and uh, how uh, are different types of assays what you can actually be able to set up the to measure the enzyme activity. Now, when you talk about the enzyme activity, you are actually going to talk about the several types of uh, en enzyme catalyzed reactions. These enzyme catalyzed reaction could belong to the catabolic reactions or the anabolic reactions. So, anabolic reactions are the reactions which are going to be used for synthesizing the new molecule whereas the catabolic reactions are the reactions which are where uh, uh, you know the biomolecule is going to be broken down or oxidized to generate the energy. Now, when we talk about the enzyme uh, activity, uh, this means we are actually going to talk about that the enzyme is actually processing the substrate and in that process the enzyme is actually going to generate the product okay and if you want to measure the enzyme activity and if you recall in our previous lecture we have discussed what are different ways in which you can be able to express the enzyme activity so one of the classical way of expressing the enzyme activity is that you are going to express the enzyme activity in the units right and every unit is actually going to be defined as the amount of enzyme required to convert a one micromole of substrate into the product in a given time or one minute and uh, so uh, this we can calculate so enzyme activity can be calculated if we want to if we can be able to measure the uh, consumption of substrate or the production of the product right now if i want to if i want to measure the substrate or the product i could actually be able to use the exclusive property associated with this particular substrate or exclusive properties associated with the uh, product right so in that case so in many cases we can actually be able to see the disappearance of the substrate in some cases you can be able to see the appearance of the product right when you see the appearance of the product it is actually going to give you the positive signal okay so this is actually going to give you the positive signal which means you are actually going to see a increase in some value right so it is actually going to give you a positive signal Whereas when you are going to see a disappearance of the substrate, then it is actually going to give you the negative signal, right? What is mean by the negative signal is that your starting molecule, for example, if you started with 100 molecules of substrate, then after, so at time zero, for example, right? At time zero, you have started with 100 molecules of substrate, right? After 10 minutes, it is actually going to be 80, right? So suppose, 100 molecules of uh, and suppose we are you know measuring the absorbance of this particular substrate right and this is actually exclusive right so and does not have the any kind of cross reactivity from the product or the enzyme then for example if you have the absorbance of this 100 molecule as 0.8 for example then 80 molecule will actually going to show you an absorbance of 0.6 after 20 minutes, you are going to have an absorbance of 60, 40, like that. And ultimately, it is going to be zero, right? So similarly, you can actually be going to have a decrease in absorbance, right? This means you are actually going to know what is the amount of substrate going to be consumed if you are actually... So uh, you started with 100 molecules. Now you have 80 molecules, right? So you can actually be able to take this value and you will say, okay, point two OD substrate is being consumed in 10 minutes and and that is the way you can be able to use these values to calculate the uh, enzyme activity. Similarly, when you are going to talk about the positive signal, you are actually going to say that uh, same way, right? You can have the time, you can actually be able to say at the starting, you are going to have zero molecules 
and you are going to have zero absorbance. So it's actually going to say absorbance, number of product molecules, right? And like that, okay. So time zero, you're going to start, there will be no product form, right? Because the enzyme has just started the reactions. And then absorbance is also going to be zero, right? Then after 10 minutes, you are actually going to see 20 molecules, right? This is not exactly what is happening, right? 20 molecules are going to be consumed, right? So 20 molecules are going to be uh, produced, right? So 20 molecules are going to show you an OD of suppose 0.35, okay? Similarly, you can have 20, 30 like that, and it is actually going to show you 30 molecules, 40 molecules like that. So it's going to show you an absorbance of 0.5, and it's going to show you an absorbance of 0.7 something. So this is actually the direct measurement, right? Here you are actually going to plot this. So 0.35 is the concentration of the substrate uh, product, right? And you can actually be able to say that this, this is the amount of the product is being formed. And that's why this is, this is the same amount of substrate is being consumed so that you can actually be able to use for calculating the enzyme. So that's why you see when you are measuring the product, it is easy and straightforward. Whereas when you are measuring the substrate, you are actually going to go through with the uh, another uh, you know function right you are, have to always calculate the delta absorbance right you have to calculate how much absorbance is gone down right so in this case the 0.8 to 0.6 then for example here from here to here again 0.2 from here to here it's going to be 0.1 like that so here you have additional step and when you have the additional step more steps means you are actually going to increase the number of chances of incorporating the errors. And that's why it is advisable to go with the positive signal rather than the negative signal. Or I will say you should not measure the disappearance of the substrate rather than you can actually be able to measure the appearance of the product. So uh, depending on the um, different types of properties of the substrate or the product, the enzyme assays can be done by the utilizing the different types of techniques. What are these techniques? You can actually be able to use the photometric assays. So you can actually be able to use the uh, photometric assays where you can actually be able to change in absorbance or you can actually be able to change in the fluorescence and you can actually be able to say luminescence and all that. And then you can also have the radiometric assays. So these radiometric assays where you are going to see the change in the radioactivity uh, of the substrate or the product and then you can also have the chromatographic uh, techniques which you can also use for measuring the enzyme assays and here you can actually be able to capture uh, the uh, capture the substrate or the product right and uh, you can actually be able to measure that uh, with the help of either the radiometric assays or the photometric assays and then you can also have the gel electrophoresis so you can actually be able to you know visualize the product onto the electrophoresis um, uh, gel and that you can also be able to use for measuring the enzyme activity or enzyme assays so enzyme assay is a very very complicated uh, you know recipe or i will say enzyme assay is a complicated protocol where you are going to use not only one uh, type of assay you can may have the possibility of using the multiple combinations of different types of techniques. For example, you can actually be able to use the chromatography techniques to isolate the product, right? And you can actually be able to use uh, this product and you can actually be able to quantitate this product with the help of either the photometric assays or radiometric assays. Same way, you can actually be able to use the electrophoretic assays or electrophoretic system to visualize the substrate and then you can actually be able to use either the photometric assays or radiometric assays to quantitate the uh, product right so let's start first with the photometric assays and we'll discuss different aspects of photometric assays how you can be able to what are the different precautions you should take when you are setting up the photometric assays and when we'll discuss about the uh, you know, UV visible spectroscopy and as well as the fluorescence spectroscopy, how you can be able to exploit these techniques for setting up a fluorometric assays and uh, uh, photometric assays and how you can be able to utilize that for measuring the enzyme activity. 
So photometric assays, uh, as the name suggests, photometric assays means you are actually going to absorb or you are actually going to see something with related to light, right? Photometric means, photo means light, metric means measuring, right? So you are actually going to do the light measurements, whether the light is going to be absorbed by the um, substrate, right, or product or it is actually going to be that the substrate or the product is actually going to produce the light, right? Sometimes you can actually have to, you know, we'll be able to see that if there is a product which is formed, it is actually, you know, giving the light, right? Or sometimes you can actually have the alternative, right, where you are going to excite the molecules um, and then it is actually going to give you the fluorescence, right? So fluorescence is also of phenomena where you are actually going to measure the light intensity only, okay? So let's discuss and start discussing about the photometric assays. So as the name suggests, the photometric assays are the most commonly used type of enzyme assays. They are convenient and capable of producing the accurate and reproducible result on large number of samples in a short period of time. So photometric assays are the most um, uh, popular and most important and it is easy to perform and uh, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of instruments, in terms of the reagents, uh, they all are very much, uh, you know, uh, cheap actually. So it's uh, economically very viable. The chemical transformations that accompany the enzyme catalyzed conversion of substrate to product frequently results in a useful change in the optical property of the system under the investigation. So either there will be a change in the substrate uh, absorbance or there will be a change in the uh, product absorbance, okay? So either you can have a very exclusive product which actually can give you the exclusive, uh, uh, you know, the light absorption phenomena or you can actually have a substrate which is going to show your disappearance. When the reaction is uh, catalyzed by the enzyme under assay, do not produce a useful change in optical property addition of the appropriate additional reagent frequently allow the reaction to be photometrically monitored. So these are actually going to be a couple of examples where neither the substrate nor the product are exclusive. Then you can actually be able to add some coloring agent and that coloring agent is going to either react with substrate or the product and then ultimately it is actually going to give you the uh, colored change actually and that's you can actually be able to monitor with the help of the photometric uh, um, systems. The other photometric methods are less commonly used than enzyme assay based on change in light absorbed by the solution as the reaction processes. Change in the fluorescence and the turbidity of the solution on the other hand provide the fundamentals foundations for useful optical method for assaying the enzyme. So before we discuss and uh, you know, understand the phenomena of the photometric assays and how you can be able to design the assays, let's discuss some basics of the photometry and how it actually works. So first thing what we have to discuss is we have to discuss about the absorption phenomena. So what you know is this is the, uh, this is actually the, uh, the UV will well spectra, right? And uh, what you see is this is the uh, radiation of the different wavelengths, right? So you started from the radio waves, you can actually be able to talk about microwaves, then you have infrareds. And on this side, you have the ultraviolet, X ray, and gamma, right? So as you go from this side to this side, there will be decrease in wavelength, and that's how there will be an increase in uh, intensity. And this is the region which is called as the visible light or this is going to start uh, from the uh, from somewhere around 400 nanometer to uh, 700 nanometer, right? So that is will be the called as the UV uh, visible spectroscopy and next to the 400 nanometer is go up to the 250 nanometer or sometime it's going to be 190 nanometer and that is going to be called as uh, UV range, okay? So UV region also can be used for photometric assays. So you can actually have the UV visible uh, range, uh, range of the spectrum and that can be used for the all the photometric uh, uh, set a, a, assays. So visible light is of wavelength between the 400 to 750 nanometer. Compounds that absorb light in this range are colored 
many colorless compounds also absorb light in the uv range that is from the 200 to 400 nanometers and uh, light absorption occur when the electron in a irradiated absorbing molecules are promoted to a high energy level because the frequency of the electronic oscillation in the molecule coincide with the frequency of the irradiating lights the wavelength of this frequency is that it which compound absorb maximum amount of light is depend on the structure of that particular molecule the amount of light absorbed depend on the probability that the electronic transition occurs and if you recall in our uh, in a couple of module back when we were discussing about the uh, you know the different types of uv visible spectroscopy we discuss about that when when we were saying that how you can be able to use the spectroscopy for uh, for measuring the enzyme substrate interaction right that time we discuss about how the absorption is uh, changed even if you have a slight modification of one group or there is a uh, you know substitution of uh, the few more groups right so remember that when we were talking about how the absorption phenomena is changing when the benzene is uh, getting you know function fun uh, benzene is getting substituted at different uh, uni uh, values and so on uh, so uh, second thing what we have to discuss is about the absorbance so absorbance is uh, a is equal to minus log i by i0 and where i0 is the light transmitted by the solution not containing the chromophore right so it is uh, i0 is the light transmitted by the solution not containing the chromophore which means that this is and the i is a light transmitted by the solution that does contain the chromophore okay and a is the absorbance so a is actually a ratio of i by i0 and uh, because this is a ratio it does not have any unit because you so it, that is very important right many times in, even in the uh, different types of exams they will actually going to ask uh, what will be the unit of absorbance so it is a unit less uh, property how you can convert the absorbance to the concentrations right so absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration right so if you if you recall from the beers lambert law what beers lambert law is says that absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration and absorbance is also directly proportional to the path length which means if you combine these two absorbance is going to be equal to the epsilon cl right and epsilon is called as the molar absorption coefficient and the uh, unit is mole per centimeter right so if you keep or if you keep the path length constant right if you keep the path length constant then the absorbance then the concentration is going to be the absorbance divided by the epsilon okay so when the path length of the qh or path length of the light path is one centimeter it is going to be constant right so if it is a constant event we can actually be able to ignore this right and that's how the amount of as you will increase the concentration there will be an increase in absorbance and you can actually be able to calculate the concentration of the uh, molecule with the help of the absorbance divided by epsilon okay this means if you can have the molar absorption coefficient of the molecule you can take the you know, defined uh, you can take the molecules put it into the qh and then you, if you measure the values right if you measure the absorbance and then you can actually be able to just divide that value by the molar absorption coefficient it will actually going to tell you what will be the concentration in terms of moles right and uh, that is the very very you know it's a uh, powerful tool right to uh, measure right there are deviations from the beer lambert law and that we are not going to discuss here because there are uh, saturations and then there will be a product uh, dimerizations and uh, you know this uh, defragmentations and all that so that is actually going to change the uh, this particular relationship but that is our called as the deviation from the beer lambert law and that you can actually be able to study from any of the classical biochemistry book that or biophysics books like i think the if you go through with the uh, book right, uh, Wilson and Golding, right? Uh, so if you think about this, right, you can actually be able to know this, right? So uh, you can actually be able to study about the deviation from the uh, from the 
Mears Lambert law, and that is going to be helpful to understand under what conditions the law will not be applicable, and then we should be a little more careful. Okay. Now let's talk about the instrumentation part. So instrumentation of the spectrophotometer. So all photometric instruments operated by the same basic principles. Light from a light source of a specific wavelength is passed to the qubit containing solution of our interest, right? Molecule which you, for which you want to measure the absorbance, which is then detected by the photometric detector, right? So what you see here is you are going to have a light source. Then in front of this light source, you are going to have the monochromator. So monochromator is nothing but a prism, right? So it's going to have a prism. And uh, you know that when the light goes through the prism, it actually diffract and that's how it is actually going to show you the different wavelength, right? And uh, remember that when the white light goes into the uh, prism, it actually going to split into different uh, uh, seven color, right? And uh, since it got fragmented into seven color, you can actually be able to rotate this prism and that's how you can be able to select the wavelength of your choice. So same is here, you can actually be able to rotate this and that's how the, sing, uh, the your wavelength of your choice will enter into this particular slit, right? The slit will be a small uh, gap between and or the hole and from there you can actually be able to allow the in entry of this particular array, right? And then there will be a place where you can actually be able to keep the qubit and that's how the qubit is actually going to have the molecule right for which you want to measure the absorbance and that's how the uh, uh, the unabsorbed light will actually going to pass through the qubit and it is actually going to be detected by the uh, detector and detector could be of many types it could be photodiodes or photomultipliers so wavelength of the absorption for different chromophore is is different right and therefore it is essential to restrict the wavelength of light source before the chromophore is exposed to it now we will discuss about the different components so first component is the light source right the selection of the light source is predominantly depend on the wavelength in which the measurement are to be made so either the uv visible or uv range or the visible range the most uh, used light source for the glass uh, enveloped filament uh, tube bulb the quartz enveloped tungsten halogen bulb or the deuterium lamp and more recently the xenon lamp so many of these uh, lamps are available. You can actually use the tungsten lamp or you can use the halogen lamp. You can use the deuterium lamp and you can also use the xenon lamp. And all they are actually capable of providing the light of the different wavelengths so that you can actually be able to use according to your uh, choice. And sometimes what happens is that in, in some of these spectrophotometer, you may have the two lamps rather than single lamp, right? So you can have the lamp for the visible range you can have the lamp for the uv range to cover the useful uv visible range that is from 200 to 700 nanometer an instrument using both deuterium and the quartz halogen lamp is usually necessary although diode array instrument rely on a single so low pressure deuterium lamp that emits sufficient light over the whole uv visible range okay so you have the choice you can actually be able to use the two lamps you can actually be able to use the single lamp then we have the uh, wavelength selector. So this is called as a diffraction grating, right? Or the prisms, right? Uh, so the reliability of the absorbance values will highly will depend on the accuracy of the wavelength to which the chromophore is exposed. That is the specific wavelength, right? So selection of the lambda is very important, right? And that's why the wavelength selector is a very, very important component of the spectrophotometer. The colorometric simply use a series of filters to filter out all the wavelength other than that of a required specific wavelength. But the availability of range filter is very small and sometimes the wavelength to which the chromophore is exposed is all is a well away from its normal lambda max values. Okay, So there are many ways in which you can be able to use the wavelength selectors. You can have the filters. Uh, you can have the diffraction gratings, uh, you can have, uh, you know, the prisms, right? So depending on the price of the instrument, you can actually have the different types of uh, things, right? 
and uh, that's how you can actually be able to have the precision in terms of selecting the particular wavelength and if you are going to have multiple wavelengths it's actually going to you know uh, it's actually going to affect the final absorbance phenomenon the modern spectrophotometer uses a holographic diffraction rating uh, to disperse the light from the source into a spectrum. Rotation of the diffraction grating varies the light or uh, wavelength of the element uh, emergent light passing through a slit and to extent to which this approximate to a monochromatic light depend on the wavelength of the slit and it is described in the specification of the instrument as the bandwidth. So, bandwidth is the deviation from the selected uh, wavelength. Okay. Then you have the determination of the absorption spectra. So, many photometric enzyme assay problems can be solved more quickly if the absorption spectra of the solution involved can be determined rapidly. This can only be accomplished in an instrument that uses physical movement of the diffraction rating to irradiate the sample with the monochromatic lights. This means you can actually be able to absorb you can actually be able to have the absorption spectra of the molecule, right? So you can actually have like lambda on this side and absorbance on this side. And that's how you can actually be able to know where this particular molecule is absorbing. And that's how you can actually be able to choose this. And this is this wavelength, which where they have the maximum absorbance it can is called as the lambda max. So if you have a that kind of instrument where the diffraction rating can very precisely be able to move around from one from the different positions and that's how it can actually be able to eliminate the sample with the uh, monochromatic light of different wavelengths then it can actually be able to give you very precise value for the lambda max and that's how it actually can help you to decide what lambda max i should use for the detection purpose modern instruments allow a full spectrum to be determined in less than three seconds a diode array instruments uh, capture all of the point on the spectra at the same time and the spectra can be measured at one second intervals. One major drawback of this is that since sample is exposed to all possible spectrum uh, problems may arise. Okay? Then we have the cuvette holders. So maintaining the constant temperature is essential for the continuous assay. Electrical heating is preferred over circulatory water bath. This means you can actually have the uh, you know, the electrical heating right, rather than water circulation because water circulation, the fluctuation is going to be more. Uh, many instruments have multiple cuvette holders allowing the multiple continuous assay to be performed at the same time while the automatic mechanical movement of the carriage between the measurements. It is also ideal in having a cuvette holder which accepts cells of the path length uh, other than the one centimeter. And the very important thing is the limits and the source of errors. So when you are when you are doing the enzyme assays, you always have to be very, very careful about this particular phenomena that you are going to have limits until you are. So you are actually going to have a range in which you are actually going to be utilized or you can be able to use the assay and then what are the different sources through which you are actually going to get the error? Because if you know the sources, you can actually be able to minimize or you can be able to uh, take it into account so that you can be able to correct for those errors. One is the non-linearity arising from the stray light. Okay, So the light that uh, originates from the instrument and passes directly to the photo detector without even passing through the cuvette is the source of this error. Remember that when you are actually having a bulb, right? And from the bulb, you have a filter, uh, you have a prism, right? Then you have a slit and then you have a cuvette, right? So if you have the solution, right? So there are actually going to be, so it's actually going to enter, right? And there will be some rays which are actually going to go directly and they will actually going to hit the detector, okay? And these direct light which goes to the detector are actually going to provide a source of this error. The deviation of the linearity between the concentration and absorbance is predicted by the beers lambert law it often uh, due to the instrument rather than the complex behavior of the chromophore. Despite the best effort this error will always occur and it is accounted by the passing the light to the empty cuvette with the solid opaque object in the 
and nothing the observance okay that means how you can be able to correct this what you can do is just add just put this qubit which does not contain any sample okay so if that happens there will be some amount of light which is actually going to be passed through without this sample is going to absorb and that you can actually be able to measure so imagine that if that light is is so if is is the amount of light which is actually directly be getting into the detector then you should subtract that amount into uh, that that light you should actually be able to add onto the uh, uh, the intensity so what you are going to do is your apparent absorbance would be that minus log i plus is divided by i0 plus is okay and that is actually going to somehow or some way actually going to correct the error what is going to be incorporated from the instrument then we have the instrumental noise so this is random fluctuation in the photo detector output that originate within the instrument and it is and this caused uh, this is and it's not caused by the solution okay then we have a zero drift so in a single beam instrument this is slow steady change in the apparent absorbent it is caused by the time dependent change in the photo detector and a lamp which causes the true value of i0 to change whereas the i0 value used to calculate absorbance is at that reservoir when the absorbance zero was set okay so this is this is the problem of single beam instrument right when the single beam instrument what happen is that when you have two different types of spectrophotometer you have the single beam instruments you can have the double beam instruments so if you have a double beam instrument you can continuously be able to monitor what is the intensity coming from the bulb and what is the intensity the detector is detecting but you have, if you have a single beam instrument what will happen is that initially you put the qubit and you measure the absorbance having the no chromophore right and that value you are always subtracting from the your measured value but that value which you have measured 10 minutes back may actually change over the course of time because the bulb is actually going to get warm up or there are some other artifacts which are actually going to happen so those things cannot be mapped in a single instrument right single beam instruments and because of that the double beam instruments are more preferred because they are actually going to give uh, be you know more helpful so when using a diode array uh, spectrophotometer this app problem can be avoided by the internal referencing or subtracting the absorbance reading taken at a wavelength when there is a no absorbance change due to the reaction this problem is also avoided by using a split beam instrument that determine the absorbance from the i and i0 value measured simultaneously then in the photometric assays you can have the continuous assay or you can have the discontinuous assay so when you are setting up the continuous assay which means you are actually going to have the enzyme you will add the substrate and then you are actually going to have the generation of product and that you can actually be able to measure so either you measure the substrate or the product uh, the continuous assay in which the enzyme catalyzed reaction is monitored as it occurred is preferred to one in which the enzyme reaction is run for a fixed time and then stopped before measuring the product formed the output of the spectrophotometer can readily be coupled to a computer chart recorder or x-ray plotter or printer and photometric methods are well suited to the continuous assay but before you set up the continuous assay you have to consider the following points the choice of solution for setting up the zero absorbance so for continuous that system that produce a drop in absorbance a solution containing relevant chromophore can also be used uh, to set the zero absorbance if the instrument can read the negative values then we have the temperature control so because the spectrophotometer will have the bulbs and other kinds of electronic instruments electronic components uh they will actually going to have the increase in temperature so continuous photometric assay of enzyme can only be performed at factory at a constant temperature it is especially critical to ensure that the content of the qubit are at a proper temperature you know that the temperature is actually going to change the enzyme activity number one and and uh, the temperature can also actually be able to change the dissociation of that substrate and the tem temperature can actually be able to even Uh, make lot of changes right so it that's why that a, a constant temperature in the measuring 
cuvette is very important. And then starting the reactions because time zero is very important. When you are actually setting up or when you are starting the reaction, that is very important. So it is critical to set the things so that the amount of enzyme added not result in such a quick reaction that a significant portion of it is over before even recording, re, re, uh, reading begins. If the rate of reaction is so fast that the mixing process must be rushed, the enzyme sample must be diluted to slow the reaction. So time zero is very important because you will going to say after time t, you know, after time, you know, 10 minutes, what will be the problem. But if you add like a large quantity of enzyme, if you add large quantity of, if you set up the reaction in such a way that it's going to, uh, you know, uh, you know, complete before you go to that point or before you even start measuring, then it is actually going to give you more errors. Now let's see the example from enzyme assays by the absorbance chains. So direct absorb, direct observation of reaction using the natural substrate, right? So a limited number of enzyme catalyzed reaction results in a usual change in absorbance. For example, the oxidation of NADH or the NADPH as well as the opposite reaction caused a significant change in absorbance at 340 nanometers because the, it has the epsilon uh, 340 as 6200 and uh, this simplifies the direct continuous absorbance assay of a large and important group of enzyme known as dehydrogenase. So for the dehydrogenase, what you can do is you can just add the this NADH substrate and you can actually be able to monitor the disappearance of the NADH or the reappearance of the um, molecules. So for example, you can actually be able to measure the lactate dehydrogenase. So lactate dehydrogenase is one of the most commonly measured enzyme activity enzyme because its presence in the serum after tissue damage aids in the clinical diagnosis. Because the reaction catalyzed is freely reversible, the assay can be performed either in the direction of lactate oxidation by NAD plus or in the reverse direction by the pyruvate reduction by the NADH. Reduction of pyruvate, the preferred direction for the assay. For example, this, right? So pyruvate plus NAD plus NH plus gives you the lactate and NAD plus. So it is actually consuming the NADH, right? And you know that the NADH is actually going to absorb at 340 nanometer. So if you plot this, what will happen is that you are actually going to start, like for example, you start from one, right? And uh, over the course of time, you will see that it's actually going down. So this is actually going to be like time versus uh, product, right? So this is time versus substrate, right? So this is the NADH, what you are measuring. So if you are actually going to see 10 molecules of NADH, which is going to be consumed, this means the 10 molecules of pyruvate are also going to be consumed and that's how there will be a 10 molecules of lactate which is going to be produced. And that's how you, you can use these informations to calculate the activity of lactate dehydrogenase. The enzyme may be satisfactorily assayed at 30 degrees Celsius, pH 7.2 in 50 millimolar trias with substrate concentration of 0.15 millimolar NADH and 1.2 millimolar sodium pyruvate. Then we have the indirect assay by coupling with the dehydrogenase. So because of the convenience of this change in absorbance when the nicotinamide coenzyme undergo oxidation or reduction, as well as the large number of dehydrogenase with a wide variety of specificity, these enzymes are frequently used as a final step in a coupled enzyme assays. So you can actually be able to couple these assays with the other enzyme and that's how you can be able to measure the activity. Now let's talk about the another way of doing the enzyme assay. So the another enzyme assay way of doing the enzyme assay is turbidometry. So enzymes that act on insoluble uh, polymers frequently clear the turbid solution and this property can be used to calculate the amount of enzyme present. So turbidometry means the scattering of the light. Okay. So uh, although the process is, is light scattering rather than absorbance, it can be measured with a standard uh, spectrophotometer. Such turbidometric measurements are less uh, easily uh, standardized than the absorbance measurements, partly because the reproducible suspension of the insoluble polymeric substance are difficult to obtain, but are also for instrument reasons. Okay, so these are the places where you are not measuring the absorbance, but you are measuring the scattering. Okay, as this means the scattering of the light and uh, 
uh, although the final result would be that you are going to see a disappearance of the intensity from the detector and that's how uh, you can actually be able to use this but it has a limitation that so it's not going to be uh, very reproducible because it depends on the how good your instrument is and how good your that scattering material is actually be remain in the solution right some of the scattered light reaches the photo detector and the proportion depends on the distance of the detector from the qubit so this is what is going to happen when you put the molecule in qubit and it is having the scattering properties it is actually going to scatter the light in all the directions right and some of the light is actually going to enter into the detector which is actually going to uh, affect the final results so the enzyme lysozyme for example you can be able to hydrolyze the bacterial cell wall and can be easily measured by observing the change in wtometry that occur when it added to a suspension of dried bacterial cell because this decrease in turbidity is clear the result of a complex process of progressively progressive random hydrolysis the rate cannot be expressed in molar terms so the unit is defined in terms of the rate of turbidity decrease the wavelength for this turbidity measurement is arbitrary set at 450 nanometer and the one unit of activity is defined as the rate of change in absorbance that produced an initial rate change of 0.001 per minute and when the volume in the qubit is 2.6 mR, okay? It is important to note that the volume in the qubit must be specified in this particular case because that is actually going to affect the settling process. When the same number of units are added to a smaller volume of this suspension, the turbidity change proportionally more. Then we have the third phenomena that is also can be used to measure the uh, substrate or the product concentration is the fluorescence. So fluorescence like absorption is caused by an electronic transition that converts the absorbing molecule to an exciting state. As a result, the excitation and absorption are two words that describe the same physical process. What happens when the excitation state returns to the ground state distinguishes the uh, fluorescent and non-fluorescent compound, right? So when you have a compound, for example, if you have, um, you know, the some compound, right? And if you illuminate this with a high beam of light, what will happen is that the electron in this is actually goes into a higher energy state and then they come back to the energy. And in this process, and after that, they are actually going to give you a light emitting of light from these, right? So this lambda is going to be lambda 1, this is going to be lambda 2 and then lambda 2 is actually going to be bigger than lambda 1 because in this process there will be some loss of energy and that's how the lambda 2 is going to be bigger than lambda 1. So when, whereas the energy of an exciting molecule is lost as heat in a non-fluorescent molecule, a fluorescent compound emits some of the energy as light, right? So during the 10 to the power minus 9 second interval, between the absorption and emission, the molecule loses some of its energy through vibrational relaxation resulting in a lower energy and as a result, a higher wavelength than the exciting wavelength, okay? So, fluorescence can be used and if you want to measure the fluorescence, uh, you also, you are going to have the different set of uh, instrumentations. So, this is a schematic diagram of a fluorimeter. So, Till this, it is actually be same as the spectrophotometer. So you're going to have a light source, you're going to have the monochromators, and then you're going to have a slit, and then you're going to have a qubit. And this qubit is actually going to show you the light, right? Because it's going to show you the light in all the direction. And then since you, in the spectrophotometer, you have a detector on this side, so you can actually be able to measure the uh, light, what is actually being absorbed with, by this molecule. And but in this case, what you're going to do is you're going to put another monochromator so that you can be able to select the wavelength what you are actually going to see. And then you're going to have a slit and then you're going to have a detector. OK, so what you are actually basically doing is you are actually detecting the wavelength of the light for which. So this is actually going to be a lambda one. This is going to be the lambda two and on a specific lambda two, you are going to uh, see whether that light is uh, is coming out from the sample or not. 
so the quantitation of the fluorescence so although the condition can be set up so that the relationship between the measured fluorescent emission and the concentration is linear concentration is linear uh, the concentration of fluorophore in the sample cannot be calculated by applying a universal constant equivalent to absorbance coefficient to the measured the fluorescence emission okay so fluorescence is not like absorbance very straightforward that you can be able to just put the uh, you know the molar absorption coefficient and you can actually be able to calculate the concentration of the compound so a fluorescent compound emit a fixed percentage of the light it absorbs the, that fraction is referred to as the quantum yield and strong fluorescent material have the high absorption coefficient and in a quantum yield close to 1 which means they absorb a lot of light and re emit majority of it as a higher wavelength Whereas in other cases, uh, the, the quantum yield is going to be low and that's how it is actually going to emit only a fraction of that absorbed light. Although quantum yield is constant for a given set of experimental conditions, several aspects of the instrument prevent it from being used for direct concentration measurement from fluorescence intensity measurements. The causes of non-linearity or the inner filter effect is that at the wave, exciting wavelength, all the fluorescent compound absorb light. This means the light intensity of indecent light decreases exponentially as the beam passes through a fluorescent compound solution. As a result, the relationship between the fluorescence emission and the fluorophore concentration is non-linear. This means the I is equal to IOQF 1 minus 10 to power ECL. As long as the absorbance value at both the exciting and emitting wavelengths are sufficiently low, a non-linear relationship between concentration and fluorescent emission is possible. This means if you want to use the fluorescence as a mass say, to measure the substrate or the product, you always have to use the diluted samples. Examples of the fluorometric uh, enzyme assays, so you can have the direct observation of the natural uh, reactions. For example, the NADPH dependent uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So, you remember that we have used the photometric assays also to measure the dehydrogenase assay. Same way, you can actually be able to use the fluorometric assays. So, you can actually take the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase by adding the 50 microliter of enzyme sample to a 3 ml of 0.1 molar trace PSO and 0.8 containing 3 millimolar magnesium chloride, glucose 6-phosphate and 7 millimolar of NAD+. And for NAD+, plus, the lambda excitation would be the uh, 340 nanometer and lambda emission would be 465 nanometer. So, this means you are going to excite it, thus uh, you will keep the sample into the cuvette, then you will excite it at 340 nanometer, right. So, in the monochromator 1, you are going to set as 340 nanometer and in the monochromator 2, you are going to put as the 465. Then we have the phosphobilogen uh, deaminase. So this is also another enzyme through which, which you can also be able to use to measure the enzyme activity. Then we have the enthalate and synthase. So condition for the assay is given here. And enthalate synthase is catalyzing this reaction where the corismate plus glutamate is getting converted into enthalic acid and the pyruvate. And you can be able to measure this activity with the help of the uh, flosses. Then sometimes we also use the synthetic fluorogenic substrate like the beta glucuronidase, chitinase, and elastase. So in and many of the proteases also are going to be used where the, you are using the fluorogenic pro, protease substrate. And this uh, when you are actually having the uh, in reactions, it, this fluorescence is actually going to be released. This fluor, fluorescent, uh, you know. Uh, probe is actually going to be released and that's how it is actually going to give you the increase in fluorescence. Relief of the quenching. So, an indigenous method for assaying the hydrolysis rely on a process known as the ratio-less energy transfer in which uh, from a fluorescent group on one part of polymer substance is transferred to a chromophore nearby in the same molecule without emitting the light. The process is interrupted when the substrate bond is hydrolyzed, separating the two interacting modes. Uh, examples are carboxypeptidase, aminopeptidase, and phospholipase. Then we can also have the fluorogenic reagents like the amino oxidases. 
So using a continuous system in which the homoglinic acid is converted into a fluorophore in the presence of uh, HRP, the enzyme that generate the hydrogen peroxide can be adaptive to a sensitive fluorometric assays. So diamine oxidase is acid in a phosphate buffer containing uh, homoglinic acid and 10 microgram per ml uh, HRP. So this is HRP, right? Uh, uh, Hydrogen peroxidase. Enzyme in the form of tissue sample is first mixed and shaken at 37 degrees, 37 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes with buffer and the peroxidase before starting the reaction by adding the homovilinic acid and 0.1 molar putrescine as substrate. The reaction is followed continuously at the lambda excitation of 350 nanometer and lambda emission as 425 nanometer. So, uh, there are many ways uh, in which you can be able to adopt the photometric assays and that's why you can be able to measure the uh, the enzyme assays or enzyme activity but as i said you know you should be very very careful when you are doing these kind of measurements because it's, it's a kind of a black box what you are getting the absorbance it has to be validated very carefully by running the control reactions and other kinds of things so this is all about what we have discussed about the photometric assays and uh, in the photometric assays we have discussed about the UV visible spectroscopy, we discuss about the fluorescence spectroscopy and we also discuss about the turbo method and all of these approaches are uh, you know uh, are can be a potential uh, way in which you can be able to use uh, to calculate the, uh, the concentration of the substrate or the product and that's how you can be able to determine the activity of the enzyme. So with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. Uh, in our subsequent lecture, we are going to discuss more about the radiometric assays and then we will discuss more about how you can be able to measure the activity in the gel itself and so on. So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.